Chapter 7 Royal Records I was 19, almost 20, when I left Memphis. Hunter was 28 when he stayed. He stayed in his mother's house, and she continued to serially marry and divorce. He continued to hang around the studio enough that Papa Mitchell set him up on the Chitlin Circle to recruit and retain blues artists to the label. Unfortunately, public tastes are capricious. A silly teen singing a song with only two stanzas, but a good hook for a chorus will become an instant millionaire. While truly talented musicians languish all over Memphis and Nashville. As it was, the only music genre to make less money than blues was jazz. So even though there are blues musicians with a tremendous amount of talent, most of them barely eke out a living through their music. There is, however, one bastion for blues musicians, particularly for our homegrown blues players from the Delta. The Holy Land is called the Netherlands. In one of the great cosmic ironies, blues music invented Developed and dominated by African Americans from the Delta area of Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas, finds the majority of its most ardent fans in Caucasian, Europe, 50-something men. Nowhere in the world is the blues more popular than it is in the Netherlands and Denmark. Don't talk to a Memphian, particularly a black Memphian, about the blues. They don't want to hear it, but the Europeans eat it up like crazy. Maybe it's because it's the music of sorrow and pain, but it's not their sorrow and pain. I don't know what sad Dutch music sounds like. The only Dutch musician I knew loved the blues and sang in English about Kentucky. For whatever reason, Hunter began to take over the European tour scheduling for Delta Blues artists. Back then, before FedEx took over the Memphis airport, there were daily direct flights from Memphis to Amsterdam. These flights brought artists from Nashville, Clarksdale, and the Delta to Memphis, where they would stop and record before heading off onto the European legs of their tours. He never got wealthy doing it, but Hunter was able to rub elbows and do favors for some of the best in the business. Despite the lack of financial success, Hunter enjoyed it immensely because he gave him a lot of stature. He would introduce himself as a music producer and manager of the more successful musicians. Most of the time, the bands never cared enough to correct him. Wannabe musicians and fans passed on his self-adorned titles and helped him cultivate a reputation as a real doer in the music business. The truth got lost in all the retellings, and his reputation grew. Along the way, he could make plenty of money on the side scoring drugs for the bands. If you were a recovering addict, he would do his best to get you back on the smack before the second stop of the tour. I like my stars fucked up, he would brag. He had an almost palpable disdain for other people's sobriety but it wasn't as big as his own love for cocaine. More than anything, cocaine brought out the worst in Hunter. His sense of grandiosity, along with his compulsive talking, made him difficult to be around. It also made it impossible for him to hide his scorn and disinterest in other people. The only people who saw the real Hunter were the ones who saw him when he was high on cocaine. Unfortunately, in these circumstances, they were usually high as well, so his increasingly sociopath and manipulative tendencies went unnoticed. One person who did notice was the fiancé of one of his most popular artists. Ashante saw how he would intentionally derail the sobriety of members of her boyfriend's band because it made them easier to control. 
She saw how he tried to insinuate himself into her boyfriend's business dealings or get himself a songwriting credit here and a little on the back end residuals there. Her boyfriend, Early, was a recovering heroin addict and she stayed glued to his side as a literal physical barrier to Hunter and his bag of goodies. It worked for most of the tour until one night in Barcelona. She left the hotel for a quick errand. Her boyfriend was complaining of a sore throat, so she went out for some lozenges. When she came back, he was high, with his eyes glazed, laying on the couch in their hotel room, barely breathing, but still slowly plucking guitar strings. Hunter was in the room, sitting at a small table, smoking a cigarette, and shuffling a deck of cards. He looked up when she entered the room with a smug, satisfied look on his face. He knew she'd been shielding early from him, and he resented it. She could see his hatred for her in his face, and he twisted up his face as he said, You didn't think you can be me at this, did you? You stupid, insignificant bitch. You think he's yours, do you? He laughed and stormed out of the room. She rushed over to check on Early to make sure that he was breathing and then she began to cry. The next morning, things were tense. Early wouldn't look her in the eye and he wouldn't talk to her. Two days later, when she woke up in Rome, Early hadn't come back to the hotel room after the show. When she looked outside the room, that's when she realized the tour bus was gone with her luggage still aboard. She'd gone to bed really early the night before after becoming suddenly sick a few hours before the show. She hadn't even bothered to grab her bag off the bus. She thought she'd sleep an hour and feel better. Instead, she slept 12. She didn't have any other clothes or a toothbrush. She didn't have her passport, any identification, or a credit card. All she had was a crumbled $5 bill in the pocket of her jeans. This episode was narrated by Zipporah Gray of RMP Studios in Memphis, Tennessee.